Hi, um, thank you all for coming to what we hope to be the first of five Garden in a Box learning sessions. This one is Tips and Tricks for Garden Chores. Um, I'm Kasia Nepp. I'm the Community Food Services Coordinator at Piscataquist Regional Food Center, PRFC for short. Um, our mission at PRFC is to improve se food security in the Piscataquist region by connecting people with healthy sources of food. The Garden in the Box program was thought up in 2020 and was created as an outgrowth of the University of Maine Extension Office's One Tomato program. Have any of you done One Tomato before? I have. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a project where they will basically hand out a tomato seedling to anyone who wants one, and then they track the progress at the end of the season. And someone said, wouldn't it be great if we could help people have their own vegetable gardens, not just tomatoes. Um, so the idea for Garden in a Box is to provide people with limited space, mobility issues, or resources, um, all of the tools and knowledge they need to successfully grow their own vegetable garden at home. Um, participating gardeners are given supplies and seedlings and are then coached by UMaine Master Gardener volunteers throughout the gardening season. Um, one of the creators of this project often referred to it as a decentralized community garden, and I think that really captures the essence of what we hope to do. Um, the Garden in a Box program is limited this season to 18 participants, and it's already full. Um, but through this program, we're hoping to reach a wider audience. Um, and in the next few weeks, if you come back to Thompson Free Library or several other libraries in the region, you'll be able to check out the Garden in a Box um, resource binder. And when it's a little warmer, um, you'll be able to see a Garden in a Box demo garden here out at Thompson Free Library. Um, this project is really possible because of our partnership with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension's Piscataquis office and the University of Maine Master Gardener volunteers. Um, their technical expertise is absolutely necessary. If I were by myself, I would only coach people to kill their plants. <laughs> um, so without further ado, this is Lori Bowen from the Extension Office. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning the Master Gardener volunteers. They're awesome. And like you said, without them, yeah. I'm so excited we have people in person. This is great. So, um, lots of resources on the back table for sure and um, also um, garden in the box information back there and um, and the dreaded survey is back there so if you showed up in person I'm gonna I'm going to ask you to fill out a survey you know what can I say I'm from extension that's what we do um, but tips and tricks in the garden and I have a clicker tonight. I feel very high tech. So I'm excited about the clicker. We'll see how I do with it though. Um, so if you have any questions at all, let me know. Um, and we'll get to those as they go along. I'm going to ask you for your input as we go along as well. And please let me know. I'm trying to talk really loud, but let me know if I forget and start talking softly. So our contact information at the Piscataquis office, um, right across the street, basically, uh, 165 East Main Street, and our number is 564-3301, and the email is extension.piscataquis at maine.edu. But if you want to reach me, um, it's laurie.bowen at maine.edu. So a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I've been told that cooperative extension is the best kept secret in Maine. Um, I'm starting to believe that. Um, so in case you're not familiar with some of our programs um, and some of the services we provide, um, we're providing research-based knowledge and our programs include agriculture, business and community, and that's small business especially. Uh, of course, food and health, garden and yard, home, family, youth, that's 4-H. I'm sure everyone has heard of 4-H, though. 
uh, natural resources, and then of course uh, we've got insects, plants, plant diseases, um, and that's a great service uh, too with the growing season coming up. Um, you can submit your plant samples, um, your insect samples um, to our lab. It's a free service. Um, actually, things nowadays are more like they'll probably ask you for a picture. Um, a lot of things can be done by pictures, so that's that makes things even quicker. <clears throat> so, there we go. So, for Injustice for All, so this is a direct message from our federal funder, and they want to be sure that you know you have a right to access our program and any accommodation that's necessary. And if you have questions or concerns about this, um, you can come directly to me and I can help you with that. And or if you'd like to contact them directly, this is how you contact them. And if you ever need an accommodation for one of my programs, um, just let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to help you. And I um, gonna, am going to try to remember to talk about our upcoming programs as I go along. So I have a big note here for myself. So our next program is on April 28th at 6 p.m. and that is on small space gardening. Okay. Now when I reviewed my program for tonight and the topics, it comes out that I'm a little bit partial to vegetable gardens. And I was like, well, I don't have anything against other types of gardens, like perennial gardens and like that. I just seem to think that vegetable gardening is maybe a lot more work. So when I talk about different things tonight, it's not that I am not including your other gardening projects, but um, I do keep saying vegetable. Um, so, um, but, you know, flower beds, especially ones with annuals and whatnot, those can be just as labor intensive. We're going to talk about planning your day in the garden. And I added planning the whole season because I feel like a lot of things we're going to talk about tonight are going to, if we do them now, well, soon, um, they're, they're going to save us a lot more time <coughs> later on in the season. We're going to talk about matching your garden with your capacity. Um, we'll talk about ergonomic tools. Uh, new and ones that you might already have that we can um, modify. We'll talk about proper stretching and lifting, and I'm going to try to get you all to do some stretches with me. We'll see how successful I am on that. And throughout, we'll do questions and sharing ideas and tips. So we'll dive right in and get started. <laughs> so. I like this quote, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. You can take this a lot of ways. Um, and if you can't relate to this, I bet you know someone who can. Um, when you're preparing for work in the garden, um, sometimes you can spend more time preparing than the actual amount of time that you work out there. So. That's one way to look at this. Another way is that um, we get out in the garden and we're like, oh, I should have been doing that project or that project or that project. So having an actual plan before you go out may help you stay focused on the most important tasks. Um, now sometimes, that being said, sometimes you get out there and you're like, something's been eating all my plants. I've got to take care of this right away. This is this is urgent. This is going to be more important than that weeding project that I planned on. So flexibility is key. And I had to do one more quote. So to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. There's never enough time in the garden as far as I'm concerned. I, I always lose track of time when I'm out there. Um, but I also tend to be too ambitious. When I, when I look at my garden chores, I'm not really measuring my true capacity. Um, I also overdo it. I'm always tired and sore and, you know, sunburned or something when I come in from the garden. So if I had a more realistic plan in place, then that would cut back on all of that, and I probably would be in a lot better shape to go out and work the next time. Now, 
originally this whole program was going to be geared towards um, one of the videos in our Victory Garden for Maine series we did. It's a great video series. I recommend it. And we have um, lots of links coming up to it. But um, it focuses on just your day in the garden. And I want to focus on your whole season in the garden. How to look ahead about some things that might help save you some time. So capacity and planning. So the definition of capacity is the maximum amount that something can contain. So if we're thinking about garden in the box, we're thinking about, you know, what's What's the maximum amount of plants, the maximum amount of soil, the maximum amount of water? But it's also the amount something can produce. So our capacity, I want to talk about our capacity as gardeners as to what we can do. Um, how much time, realistically, do you have to devote to garden chores? <laughs> Daily, weekly, maybe monthly, you know, depending on what kind of a garden it is. Um, and even if I have eight hours to devote to that, should I really spend that whole eight hours out there? Or am I going to injure myself and then I'll have to take another whole month off from, from my gardening? Um, the other thing is um, we're not just looking at necessarily what our garden can produce, but like I said, what we can produce. But we have to still con take into consideration what our gardens are going to produce. For example, um, we have to think ahead, you know, beyond that growing season. And again, I'm kind of thinking, you know, primarily about vegetable gardens. But we still have that harvest. It's not just getting our gardens through the summer. But when we start harvesting, you know, we've got to figure in our time, too of, you know, getting those tomatoes into the house, um, processing the tomatoes, you know, using them. Uh, of course, a lot of it will be, you know, fresh eating, but um, sometimes that's more than our capacity <laughs> um, to process, so. So I think, I'm gonna go back one. Yeah, okay. So step two. Of the planning process what and where so this is my first trip uh, tip and trick for how are we going to um, lighten our workload so to speak for the coming year so these are all links and I can provide these to everyone who's interested but the first one is the planting chart for the home vegetable garden I like this because this tells me how much I need to plant to get X amount of green beans or X amount of corn. It's going to tell me how much to plant. So if I don't overplant, then I don't have extra work that I didn't really need. You know, I don't have food that I didn't plan on having, for example. Now, also, um, that's you know that's great for if you're doing in-ground gardening. But um, also, if you're growing vegetables in container gardens like Garden in a Box, you know, that's going to um, help you determine how much you're going to have for a yield. So when you're planning your workload, you're also going to figure in, you know, I'm going to have, um, I don't know, um, $17 worth of tomatoes from my one tomato, which is a great program, by the way. I'll uh, show up here and make you all take tomatoes in the future. <laughs> um, but because I don't want you to think I only think vegetable gardens are the ones that require work. Also things like, say you have perennials and you know you need to divide them this year, you know, how much time is that going to take me? How much time should I plan on then, you know, once I get them divided, do I have to create a new garden space for them? Those are all big gardening projects that if we can get a good estimate of the amount of time, then that is going to help us manage our workload. Also things like pruning woody landscape plants, you know, that can be, depending on your property or what your gardens look like, that can be a big um, undertaking as well. But there are ways also that we can uh, decrease our workload or maybe just even take a break.
from things. Um, for instance, there are tarping methods, you know, where you basically are just putting your garden to bed for a little while. Um, you're taking a break. Maybe you're traveling a lot this year, or maybe you have some health concerns coming up, and this is just not a great year to do as large a garden as you normally do. Also, cover crops. Cover crops are another way, like say you just don't have that capacity, I keep using that word, but say you don't have the capacity this coming year to do a large garden. One of the options, cover crops that will, you know, fertilize, be a green manure for you, but at the same time it'll control the weeds so you don't, you don't lose any ground, so to speak, with keeping things going. And that brings us to other subjects. And I'm going to live dangerously. I'm going to try to use my down arrow here to see the rest of my speaker notes. Nope. No go. Okay. Bear with me. Like I said, I'm going to leave, live dangerously, but I think I have some important points here I want to make sure I get to. So, um, and this is a good time, this planning process is also a good time to take a look at things like you know, is my existing garden too large? You know, do I need to rethink what I'm doing with my space? Or, you know, if it's a community garden, for instance, are we short on volunteers this year? You know, how are we going to, um, you know, manage such a large space? You know, we know left next year everybody will be back, but this year it's difficult. You know, we have that option of tarping, we have that option of cover crops. Um, Again, if you're, you're looking at some physical limitations for the upcoming year, these are all options. <clears throat> Another option, too, is um, maybe you're going to share your garden with a friend or a neighbor. Maybe you're going to be like, you know what, you can grow in this section and, um, you know, that will keep it a, a neat and tidy for next year, but they can use it in the meantime. Um, there's all kinds of ways to really plan ahead as to what's going to be manageable and what you can do in the coming season. So those steps to planning your garden, of course. Um, this is another time saver, site selection, the location. So if your garden is right next to your driveway where your hose is, Yay, that's going to save you time and energy instead of having to lug water or install hoses or whatever you're going to have to do. I already mentioned garden size. Um, it's important to, you know, do what's manageable for you. And deciding what to grow. I think this should have been like bolded or something because it's very easy to, especially when the seed catalogs start coming in, to really, oh, I'm going to grow that, I'm going to grow that, and that, and that. And yes, I have 72 zucchinis, but it's okay. I can do it. And so we really need to be careful on deciding what we're going to grow. And I talk a lot about that, too, when I talk about food preservation, because you kind of need to know, yes, it's great that your tomatoes are wonderful, and you've got this bumper crop, but then you have to preserve them or you have to find a home for them or something like that, which finding a home for, for them is another great option, by the way. But um, decide what you really want to grow. Um, if you're limited on space and you know that you can go to the local farmer's market and purchase that for a very reasonable price, maybe, maybe you won't grow it this year. You know, maybe you'll skip that. Maybe you'll just determine what is going to be best for you to grow for what you want to eat. Or if it's uh, flowers, you know, determine what you want to grow that gives you the most joy and happiness to see. <clears throat> also location. Again, location of the vegetables in the garden. Um, where are you going to put things? Where not only are they going to grow the best and thrive, but are they going to become an issue? Uh, I'm thinking of pumpkins. Let's say you have pumpkins and they start sprawling all across the lawn and now you have no control over what's going on out there. You might, you might want to next year find a new home for the pumpkins and look to what did well where the previous year too. So 
So time of planting. Is your garden um, in an area where it's underwater until June, for example, like on my front lawn where the ducks are swimming? Um, also, finding out your first frost date is super important. And this is actually a link, and there are several, several of them out there where you can find out you know, what your estimated last fr frost date is for your area. We already talked about how much to plant. Um, when, when will the harvest be? You know, um, is that harvest going to come about the, the week I always take for vacation? Or is that going to come about the, the week that the kids go back to school? Super busy time. So we'll take that into consideration. And that planning as well is going to help us manage our time. It'll manage the availability that we have to spend in the garden. Another thing you might want to think about is what does fall cleanup look like? You know, that can be a pretty big job. You know, if you've had some issues with disease and you need to make sure you get all that debris out of there, you know, how long is that going to take as well? Does anybody have any questions or input or? Nope. Okay, again, location considerations. How far is it to the closest water source? Can I get my tools, you know, if I use a wagon or a cart, can I get my tools to the garden? Um, accessibility, is it down a very steep, slippery slope, or is it super rocky and, um, you know, it's just difficult to get to? Um, those are all things that we should talk about or think about when we're deciding, you know, where that garden's going to go. And just because, Traditionally, your garden has always been in one location. You know, if you find that you need to move it for better mm -hmm. accessibility, that's something to think about, too. So when, when we start making this glorious plan of ours, <laughs> um, we're going to prioritize our tasks. And I started to talk about that a little bit. And I did say, you know, we need to be prepared to adjust your plan. So when you get out there in the garden, um, it might be beneficial to evaluate your garden before making your plan. But I kind of find that if I start out in the garden, then I'm out there and I probably am not going to come back and make my, my written plan. Um, what part of my plan is also going to include you know how much time exactly am I going to spend out there without overexerting myself you know if it's um, 90 degrees out there that day maybe I don't want to spend the whole two hours that I designated for weeding out there again I'm going to consider what has to be done first uh, what can wait because as I said before sometimes things come up and you know your plans change one thing that usually uh, jumps up to the top of the list are annual weeds that are going to go to seed. We want to prevent that as much as we can. Um, the garden weed seeds, um, especially from annuals, um, <laughs> it's incredible how many seeds they can produce. And once they're there, um, they're there. They're there, <laughs> and they're just going to create further problems for you later on. So that's a time-saving technique. If you get them before they go to seed, it's going to save you work in the future. Um, one other thing about the weed seeds, like say you don't have time necessarily to go out there and pull all those weeds before they go to seed. I mean, if you can get them cut off, I mean, it's not the best ideal situation, but it is better than letting them go to seed, for sure. Chop them off. You know, if you can come along with, a, you know, a tool and, and chop them off before they get to seed, I say do it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's an official extension point of view, but it's mine from personal experience. How's that? <laughs> All right, so our next steps to save steps. I know that it seems like I'm repeating myself, but what can we do now to save our steps um, in the future? So again, the weeding, the watering, 
scouting and what I mean by scouting is like taking a look at you know are there insects out there is there you know early blight going on are there any of those things going on out there and deadheading uh, in some cases pruning now um, there are a couple of different things I mean by pruning we'll go over in a second and then of course we want to reduce stress on our body we want to make sure that we're taking care of you know the the biggest asset that we have because we're the ones out there doing work <clears throat> um, let's see oh this is the part where I'm going to put you all on the spot I want to know your nifty tricks and tips that save you time and energy I don't know if we have anybody on Facebook that might want to put that in chat maybe they have some great ideas of things they do Maybe they can't hear me. Maybe I'm not speaking up enough. I think I think they can hear you, but if any comments come through, I'll let you know. Thank you. Yep. That means you all are on the spot. You've got to you've got to come up with something. Um, so on the, of, on the location, I was wondering if the sun would be an important part. It's that, huge. That wasn't in the list. I was just... No, it's not in the list. It is not. Um, I was going to talk about it a little bit later on, but I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, location, 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 right? Um, we need, of course, sun, and we need, you know, it's nice to have a location near a water source just to save us time, but also, you know, soil. What are the soil conditions like where you might be putting the garden or where you might move it? Um, you know, is it great soil, but it's on a very steep slope? something like that but sun is huge we especially you know with the vegetable gardens we need that component in there because the vegetables are going to need a lot of sun so yeah that's a good one glad you pointed that out anybody else have anything chickens 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 i might put mine to work they can you put yours to work yeah. yep and they'll eat seeds and they'll eat bugs and do you find that they do any damage just they, out of curiosity. Once things get going, they, they can, so then they're excluded. But mm -hmm. they're excluded. early and late, actually, when you want to finish up, like in the fall, it's great. They'll go through there. And, and do you have any issues with um, excluding them once they're like, no, that's our that's our space to be? The good fence, is it? Good fence, yeah. So yeah. make sure the fence is all the way up. And, yep. Because once they know it's there, they'll head for it. Yeah, I think they get spot. Yeah. They <laughs> <laughs> I think they're in the tractor supply chicken. now. But. <laughs> yeah, I think chickens can spot a red tomato from mm -hmm. a mile away because I, I think they just are like, oh, there it is. So, anybody else have any uh, time saving or energy saving things they use? No? Are, are, are ducks supposed to be able to eat? The insects without destroying the plants aren't they better at that than chickens i'd heard that somewhere so this is um this is my opinion okay. and this is my yeah. knowledge so um so they have these ducks they're called weeder ducks and they're a specific <coughs> kind of duck that are you know people just really rave about them and when you look in the poultry catalogs they say you know these will be great in your garden mm -hmm. my personal experience and not just in gardens, but in the yard in general, my ducks are less destructive than my chickens because number one, um, my chickens are a lot better at scratching and turning up the earth. And also they can destroy a plant very quickly with their sharp beaks. Mm -hmm. And the ducks have that round one. So I've watched my ducks out there and just go in and around plants and not do any damage. And I've seen the um, chickens get in and just, they scratch so much, they totally expose the roots to my raspberry plants. And mm -hmm. then they were, they were exposed roots and it was a sad story from then on out. Yeah. But yeah, so there is a difference, I think. I don't, do you have ducks as well? No. No? So I have both, or I did have both. I won't tell you about that part. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I found a big difference in the amount of destructiveness that was going on out there, for sure. Um, yeah, but that, I will agree with you. Um, in the fall, um, the chickens are powerhouses when it comes to 
things going on, you know, in the yard, like leaves and, and all of that. They're just, they're suited for the task. I think they think if they earn their keep then, mm -hmm. then they won't have to worry about not laying eggs in the winter or something. I don't know. I have a thought. Um, what about the hoses with all the holes in them? You put them under the soil. So those are amazing. Okay, drip irrigation is amazing. And if you can establish that, another huge, huge time saver. But more importantly, well, I don't know about more importantly, but equally as important, it's going to, uh, it's another way to save resources because it's such an efficient way to water because you're, you're not watering on the leaves, so you're not promoting any type of disease that might occur because you're not getting the leaves wet. Um, it's, it's watering at the base. Um, it's a set it and forget it kind of thing. You know, if you have a timer as well, it's another way to save you some time is put it on a timer. Um, it's, it's amazing just how much work is saved by drip irrigation. Um, the soaker hoses, um, you know, and especially um, if you're trying to do other tasks, but you know you've got to do the watering as well, you know, because it, it depends too. Watering is important, like, should do your watering in the morning if it's possible, because if you do get water on the leaves, it'll have time to dry throughout the day. If you try to water midday, sometimes, you know, with winds and everything, you're wasting water, it's going everywhere, but on the roots of the plants where you want it. Um, it's not really recommended to water at night now because again you don't want everything staying wet overnight because that's going to encourage maybe some plant diseases so another good point i'm going to put you two on the spot for the rest of the night oh, no. so, yeah any other thoughts or questions about mulching oh mulching is the best thing ever Mulch the best type oh so i can't I answer that <laughs> um so i'm kind of um I'm very fickle when it comes to my mulches. I like them all, and I use them all, um, depending on what it is I'm doing, you know, and where I'm doing it. Um, but uh, mulches are fantastic. They're not only, actually, they're not only gonna save you time weeding, but they're going to also help with your watering. You know, you're going to um, use your water more efficiently you're going to have less weeds you have to worry about because that's going to be a weed suppressant. Um, and it, mulches don't have to be expensive. Um, for instance, cardboard. Um, I've been using cardboard personally for three years now, and I'm very happy with the results, very, very happy. I, I did use some, but then I wondered about chemicals coming off of the cardboard. Yeah. Is there... Uh, See, that, I've read a lot of articles about mm -hmm. it, and I feel like it's a very complicated issue to try and track down mm -hmm. where the cardboard right, came from. Right, I tried from. to call the box. So, <laughs> so my rule of thumb is, if it says something on the cardboard, like it just shipped battery acid, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to use it. The other thing is I remove the tape. Oh, okay. Um, I use cardboard. I don't use, um, I don't know what the technical term is, but the shiny. Mm -hmm. The COVID. Yeah, COVID. Yeah. Avoid that. Yeah. Um, and a um, couple of reasons on removing the tape, um, but I think the most irritating part for me is about midway through the season, I start seeing tape flying all over the yard and you know because it comes off and then it's it's all over the place and then you have just created another garden shore for yourself. Um, also that tape is not going to be um, suppressing any weeds for me or helping me you know build up the soil or protect the soil rather so but um, so for uh, I said I use all kinds of them so for instance um, right now over my garlic I have straw um, in my perennial bed, I have, um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bark mulch, but it's an untreated bark mulch, mm -hmm. but in the perennial bed, there's bark mulch. Um, I try not to water my perennial bed just because 
I figure they have to make it on their own. Yeah. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I have bigger fish to fry for sure. But um, so let's see. So I have that there. Oh, and um, I installed a bunch of uh, winterberry last year. And those all have cardboard down around them. So, I mean, I try to use all of them. Oh, and in my big... I call it my big field garden. I do have black plastic mulch. Oh, yeah. That's um, I shouldn't call it that because actually I'm tarping. It's thicker. You mm -hmm. know, I know that um, I wasn't going to have any kind of cover crop over that or anything. So I just laid that down to help protect for erosion. Also, it gets pretty dry, so I wanted to maintain a good moisture mm -hmm. as much as I could. So so yeah, I use them all. I don't don't have like a go-to preference is kind of like what's available and what's mm -hmm. going to work best for what kind of conditions really yeah um does the cardboard stay on through several seasons or do you do fresh release? i guess i don't understand i, I don't use cardboard except for that no that's a good yeah that's a good question so um i've had different results. Mm -hmm. So where the winter berries are that I did last year, mm -hmm. um, so far that's holding up really well and I don't see me replacing that this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's because of the thickness of the cardboard or not because I don't measure it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I have another bed I did it in three years ago mm -hmm. and I'm trying to suppress some burdock. <laughs> yeah, I've reapplied twice so far. Um, I think it kind of depends on, number one, what's trying to come up through it. But number two, um, you know how when you break down a box, a little bit of, uh, you know, so it folds in on itself, there's a little bit of a crack there. I think that just that little bit of light and exposure, they, so overlap them as much as you can. But I did notice, you know, the burdock just pushed it, just pushed it right out of the way. So I think it depends on what you're trying to suppress as to how often. Um, it might also be the thickness of the cardboard for sure. Holy burdock in E3. I know. I have to tell you, though, this is so much burdock, I don't think anybody could eat that much. I don't know why I thought, I don't know why I thought that was a good place to put a garden in, but... I guess I didn't really know that was in the area, but you'd be amazed at what comes up in the seed beds. I just, it's amazing. So, um, okay. So, all of those ways, though, like using the cardboard is going to reduce stress on our bodies because it's less work. So, that's a pretty nifty trick. Um, another recommendation, again, Victory Garden from Maine did a whole episode on managing weeds. Um, and it looks like we talked about everything I wanted to talk about just a minute ago. Um, just checking my notes here. Oh, no, this is the scary thing I wanted to show you or tell you that I didn't see previously. So, uh, common chickweed, anybody have that? For, yeah. So, Common chickweed seed production ranges from 750 seeds to 30,400 seeds per plant. So, but the average is only 25,000. But that's why I'm saying save yourself some work. Pull those weeds before they go to seed for sure. Um, I didn't mention newspapers, did I? Oh, yeah. I wonder if you didn't like chemicals in or something. Um, but do you like newspaper? I don't. I like <clears throat> newspaper. The only thing I don't like about using newspaper is if there's the least little bit of wind out there, I'm chasing newspapers. I also don't use the glossy sail papers. I don't know. I don't. I personally don't do it. So, like when somebody gives you newspapers, and you have to sift through all those, that's not time saving. That's yeah. just. Do it during the winter and yeah. stack them up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, manage those weeds. That's the best um, time saving tip, uh, really, that I can offer. 
Um, and when you mow the lawn, mow away from. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, but you know, if you have a lawn that is very uh, weed free, haha. -ha, if you do, if you have one of those kind of lawns, you can collect the grass clippings and you can use that as a mulch too. I don't have that. I let weeds be weeds in my lawn, but not, you know. So. Um, shredded leaves. Now the program that is Leave the Leaves is going to be mad at me for having just said that. Sorry. Just do some. Leave some. Um, again, I talked about watering and great points about the drip irrigation and the soaker hoses. Um, but this is a big time saver because if we think about it, what are two garden chores that take the most time and we can guarantee it's throughout the year? Weeding and watering. So if we can get a handle on the weeding by suppressing weeds and we can get a handle on the watering to save time, um, that helps us a lot because really for our vegetable gardens to do really well, we're looking at one, one and a half, maybe sometimes even two inches of water. Now that's for, you know, we're talking in-ground garden. If it's garden in the box or any other container type, then you know, you're going to have to water a little more frequently, but the good news is it's a less, less of an area. So that's, that's the good news. Um, <laughs> the other thing on that too is, um, if you're, if you're doing like, uh, perennial beds with flowers and things, plant natives, <laughs> you won't have to water as much, you know, get them established and then they can take care of themselves a lot more. Um, they're a lot hardier. <laughs> Um, it saves you time in the long run and, you know, the pollinators will thank you for sure. Um, what's another way? Um, what do you think about water from your rain covers? Is that so that's okay? tricky. So that's okay. tricky. You have to be careful with the rain from your gutters because um, the rain that's coming off your roof is coming, you know, over your shingles and all of that. And you have to time it with when you're going to harvest. And you want to be careful about getting that water on the leaves. So especially if it's like something you're going to eat the leaves, like say spinach or lettuce or something like that, you know, you're going to have to be super careful to, to water at the base of the plant. We always want to do that anyway, but in particular. Right. Now, <coughs> if, if you're not planning on eating whatever you're watering, it's, you know, it's kind of a... I mean, point, if you're, you know, putting it in your perennial bed or something like that, but you do have to take into consideration for sure, um, you know, if you're watering something that you plan on eating. Um, if you have well water, you know, there's not a, you know, concern there. Uh, of course, if you have municipal water, you don't have to be concerned about that. Um, if it's like from an irrigation pond or something like that. Uh, again, you have to take into consideration the harvest time. You know, it's a, it is a consideration, so. But, you know, I say um, if you have that water coming off your gutter, install a rain garden and trap that and let it, you know, dissipate naturally and grow some pretty plants <laughs> while you're at it. <laughs> um, I told you, yeah, water in the morning. Um, oh. I didn't talk about this though. Instead of going out and making yourself go out like every single day and water a little bit, water less often, water deeper. You know, um, I, I don't like to water every day. I don't have time. I do basically, <clears throat> on average, I do one deep watering once a week. Now, that does not include any containers I have, of course. Um, you know, particularly uh, hanging baskets or my window boxes, those dry out, you know, a lot faster. There's less, you know, uh, soil in there. But uh, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and water deeply and water less often. Yeah. Is there a way to tell when you've properly soaked your garden? Mm -hmm. You know, because I think either a container garden to go, like you think you've reached it, and you're like, well, if you dig down, <coughs> is there a way to tell? It's very hard to tell it is. Um, so if I'm watering out in the 
in the you know in ground garden mm -hmm. then um, what I can do is I can use my um, I'm, I've got rain gutter stuck in my head. What am I doing? <laughs> Thank you. Rain gauge. Yes. Use my rain gauge. Um, I also, um, it's also hard to tell if you have mulches down, too. You know, this, that's, that's also deceptive. So um, I have little tri tricks and tips in my head. Like, I don't even know how accurate it is, but it gives me a good sense. So, like, I will uh, take the hose because everybody's water pressure pressure is different. So I'll see how long it takes me to fill up a bucket with one inch of water. And then when I go to the plants, I kind of count. That's smart. Yeah. I don't know if that, you know, that's what I personally do. Now, um, if it were a, um, any type of container garden, um, I'll admit it, I cheat. There are these things called moisture meters and you stick them in and you can, and they go down quite far. And you can see, you know, how far down, you know, it's watered. But the other thing I can also do if I forget it in the house or something is I just stick, you know, my hand down in there and I see, you know, I just watered. Let me see how far down it went. You know, some of it is going to soak down after a while, but not really enough. So I just reach in and stick either, you know, my finger or my hand down in there and I see, did I water all the way down? And then that gives me a reference for next time, okay. how much I need to water to really soak that. Um, same thing with pots. The thing to remember though with pots is if it's, you know, mostly root in there because, you know, it's grown so much, it's not going to have as much soil to hang on to that that mm -hmm. water. So you, that's when you're going to be watering more often too with pots. But yeah, I don't have a good, like, tried and true, I mean, those are my suggestions. I'm going to get so many calls tomorrow. I hope my bosses are watching right now. They're like, that's not scientific. <laughs> um, so scouting your garden, for sure. Got to scout your garden. Um, I think this is one of the more relaxing chores in the garden. I like doing it, you know, it's like the one time I'm like, oh, I'm not working hard, look at all my pretty plants, and you can get a good assessment about what's going on. Sometimes I combine deadheading with scouting, so like, you know, if I've got some spent blooms or something like that, you know, I'm doing both things at once, it's a good time saver. Pruning, um, I said I would talk about pruning later on, so if we're talking about pruning now, you know, when we're out there, you know, getting after, you know, uh, certain shrubs and things, then yeah, it's a big job. Um, take it in small increments. If we're talking about pruning later on, like pruning our tomatoes, that's, you know, that's one of those jobs that gets underestimated, I think. I think it's a tedious job, and I think it takes a while, so you need to plan for that. Um, all these things are going to help reduce that stress on your body. See how I keep stressing stress on your body? So, um, so we're going to work smarter, not harder. We're going to outline my tasks and we're going to make that plan. Um, before I go out, I'm going to assemble all my tools. I'm going to make sure I have what I need so that I'm not making 50 trips back and forth to get the right tool. I'm going to remember to hydrate. I'm going to take water with me all the time. Every 15 minutes, whether I'm thirsty or not, I'm going to be drinking water. Um, lifting smart and adapting your tools. And as I said, one of your tools is yourself. So we're going to adapt ourselves to um, these jobs that we have. So when we lift, I know you've all heard it, lift with your knees. Um, Bend at the hips, not with your back. We're going to lift things close to our body. Um, so, for example, um, I always catch myself doing this. Instead of going over and picking it up like this, no, I'm in a hurry. So I just try to lift it up like that. You know, is there any worse body mechanics in the world? No. So bring that in close to you and then lift it. Um, another, see, this is like so bad that I'm putting these things on here because I do all these things myself, but 
Um, do multiple lighter loads. Break up those loads. Put them in a wheelbarrow. Do whatever you need to do, or a <coughs> cart or wagon. Use, you know, the lever and fulcrum. You use dollies and carts, you know, whatever you can do. Because it, at the time, it may not seem like much, but if you keep doing it over and over, you're going to have wear and tear on your body. So this is some of the um, adaptations we can make to some of our common tools. Um, easy grip trowels. So, so this is good because... See how, you know, you're right out straight and you're, you're in a straight line. Um, it's a neutral position, I guess is the way to put it. So it's, it's stress-free and also um, it's got that nice ergonomic handle there. You know, it's got some cushion on it. So you can see that one and how, how nicely in line that is. So I know this isn't the same tool. But if you think about using this tool, you know, I, I don't have any support here. I'm kind of going all off. I mean, this is a great way, especially, it may not seem like much if you're doing just a small area, but if you're doing that over and over and over again, you know, you want to want to be careful um, just how much you do the same task over and over again. Another one Our tools, there's quite a few tools in this slide, as you can see, and there's a couple points here. The right tool for the right height, okay? Um, even consider buying children's tools if that's what's going to fit you better. Uh, they're lighter. They just fit different body sizes, so use the right tool that's right for you. Uh, this is the round, but there's also a D-shaped handle. And one of the things you can do on the D-shaped is, well, these already have, these already have the cushion. This is just pipe insulation here. Take some pipe insulation, and you can slide this over most of your tools. Um, I could have put it, I could have put it on this one if this were mine, but um, I'll show you. I was going to talk to you about putting these on the handles, but just put it on there, and of course it'll be split. Take your duct tape. Wrap it around. It's all secure. Now you've got cushion as well. The other thing is how do you know how thick to make it? Take your thumb and your finger. Okay. And then you want, that's about how big you want it. So just find whatever pipe insulation is going to fit your hand. And this is how you reference how much to put on there. So. Um... Retractable tools. Um, with these, you can use them um, even if you're sitting down, if you're sitting on your bucket. Um, I guess they're not retractable. I guess they're called telescoping. Yeah. Um, and then again, raised beds. These are great. These are, are V-raised beds. These are awesome. Um, nothing... I can't find any problems with these. I think they're a great asset. <coughs> um, this is a homemade seed cedar. So um, this little this little part right here on the bottom, this little curve, you know what that is? That's not where the seed is going. That's just to measure how far apart the seeds are. So you can take that on and off. Um, but you don't have to bend over. You don't have to be down on your hands and knees. You just take the seed, you put it through the little hole, Boom, it's down there. You can go right along with that rather than trying to crawl along on the ground. I'm sure you've all seen these. Uh, these are benches, garden benches. Um, if you want, you can flip them so the green part is on the ground and now you're down on your knees and you can use the legs to help you stand up. If you'd rather use just knee pads, that's fine too. I think this is super clever. Um, I <laughs> I don't know why, but I do have hanging baskets. But instead of number one getting out a ladder, which could lead to a whole host of problems, or standing on a very unstable five-gallon bucket, 
This is on, uh, you can just pull it down. It's on a pulley. Water it, deadhead it, up it goes. I was also thinking if you have um, a plant like, um, I don't know, something that you didn't want um, critters to get into, you know, that might be, I don't know. I was just, oh, and here's our pipe insulation again. Also, um, if you're using tools, this can help absorb vibration. So, you know, like with a weed whacker, how shaky your arms get after a while. Folding tables, portable tables in the garden are a great thing. If you're, for instance, dividing a bunch of perennials, um, instead of being down on your hands and knees the whole time, once you get them dug and you're, you know, pulling them apart and whatnot, set them up on the table. And that goes for a ton of other garden tasks, too, you know. And it gives you a chance to be in a different position in your body, you know, instead of constantly kneeling. Five-gallon buckets, my favorite garden tool. Uh, I'm not ashamed. I love the five-gallon bucket. Um, it can be my stool if I'm tired of kneeling. Um, <laughs> it can be uh, um, something I carry all my tools out to the garden in. Um, if I've cleaned it, it can be something I harvest in. Um, it, it serves many purposes. It's one of my favorite, as I said. Now, the only thing is, sometimes the handles on these, it, you know, they start to really hurt your hand. So, if you take your pipe insulation, put that on your handle, and then tape it on, of course, um, you know, that's going to help you, especially if you have poor grip strength, that's going to help a lot. The other thing is have two. Split whatever you're carrying into two and even out your load. I'm almost over time, so I didn't, I'm not, I was going to show you how to do this, but <laughs> it talked too much. Uh, let's see. So you are your number one priority out in the garden. You are the number one um, asset to your garden. <clears throat> So don't let the dirt hurt. And that's from Arkansas Agribility. And I just love their logo, which is one of the reasons that I included this. The other is they have some great stretches. And I hope you all take one of their bulletins on your way out. There's some great stretches. And the best thing is um, they're not complicated. You can do them sitting down. You can do them before you start out into the garden. You can do them while you're sitting on your five-gallon bucket during garden and after. Stretching just four minutes before, during, and after your garden uh, is very doable. It can reduce the tightness, stiffness. Um, if you've been sitting for a while, it's a great thing to do. Um, I missed one, though, that I wanted to talk about. Let's see real quick. Nope. <coughs> um, I think that's all I've got uh, for slides. I'll remember what I was going to tell you about. Other than, yeah, there are tons of um, stretches. There are some other things about um, creating other ways to adapt your garden tools to what works for you in the back. There's also uh, information of Garden in the Box up there. And I want to make sure that I do mention um, how you can um, get more information on Garden in a Box, um, prfoodcenter.org. Okay. And like I said, there's information in the back there. The binder is um, here at the library always. And we also talked about, um, they're going to be a, a demo garden here. They're also going to be a demo garden over at the Cooperative Extension office. So it'll be fun this summer to keep track of it and see what it's doing and all of that. Maybe you guys can like take pictures and stuff because the one, I have to say in advance that the one that's going to be at um, the extension office is going to be documented a lot because it's going to be a challenge because I'm not there all the time to make sure it's watered. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to take lots of photos to see how we overcome that. We're going to try lots of different tips like, uh, tricks like, um, you know, filling up um, a plastic bottle and turning it over and stuff. So it'll be quite dramatic. Are you dramatic. building your gardens behind the building? 
uh, it's going to be right on that cement outlet right okay. there. Yeah. So it's going to be in a terrible spot yeah, for it. It's going to be great. Raised or ingrown? No, it's it's the um, the growing bag. Yeah, it's the big growing bag. Yeah, it's twenty gallons, right? Yeah. Yeah. The demo gardens are twenty gallons. Yeah. So it's going to be great. It's going to be dramatic. We'll take lots of pictures. We had one in front of the library last year, and we took care of it all year. And people would come in and pick off the cherry tomatoes yeah. and things like that. So. Yeah, that was beautiful. <laughs> that's, really that's, well. yeah. oh, that's what got me so excited. <laughs> I'm very excited for one tomato this year. Uh, extremely excited. Um, I'm looking forward to, to handing out tomatoes to everyone and then finding out how, how, how they grew. Um, I believe I'm correct in that last year the yield of the tomatoes was the equivalent of, equivalent of $17. Mm -hmm. worth of tomatoes. Oh, wow. So that's pretty darn good right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So that's all I have. Does anyone have any? Yes. So first time, I mean, my father-in-law grew had gardens for years, so I, um, unfortunately he passed, so now I no longer have the benefit of those gardens, um, yeah. quantity and quality. But um, raised bed, or in-ground versus container gardening. Any preference? Any dependence? I can't choose. <laughs> <laughs> I will be honest with you. I have plenty of space, but I have such horrible soil that is so. It's just it's. I should have become a potter instead of a gardener because it is so heavy clay, wow. and it's so hard to deal with the the weed infestation and whatnot. That I not only have raised beds, but I also have in ground. Now. When, you, when we think of raised beds, though, one of the things we don't think about is that it doesn't necessarily need something to contain it. We can mound that dirt up, mm -hmm. you know, and it can, it's the equivalent of, it's a raised bed, right. mm -hmm. but we didn't go out and buy the lumber to put around it. Mm -hmm. So there are, um, are some areas where it's truly raised, but it's, it's a garden. There's no wood keeping it, you know, and I go through and I make my little row walkways and then put the dirt over and also you get the advantages of a raised bed for sure like it dries out faster okay. you know in the spring and all of that so it all depends on what meets your needs i think they're both very good options and you can have both you don't have to choose that's the best part yeah okay I am done. Thank you very much for having me. Did I say oh, yeah. for the 50th time, April 28th at 6 p.m.? Also, um, yes. If you meet me in the parking lot. Oh, I forgot. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I have seed starting medium from the extension office. Yeah. So, not. Not to be crazy, but if you meet me out there, <laughs> she's got the stuff. And the other thing is, I, I forgot to mention the seed library. Oh yeah, and we are we, we do have our seed library set up. Uh, we're still adding some things to it, but it'll be available in the library through the next couple of months if you want to pick up some seeds. It's usually just to pick up a few different seeds to try out um, other kinds of plants. It's not really plant an acre with what we have there or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, and if you have any to donate, if you have any, um, you've already donated a lot of squash and pumpkins, so if anyone wants squash and pumpkins, we are set. Yeah. Um, but if you have any sitting around, even older seeds, sometimes people, you know, have 20 seed bags that they'll never get to. We have a place for those in here, and people take those home, and if they grow, they grow, and if they don't, they don't. It's a nice experiment. Um, and this is the first of, you, you're going to do five or six programs this year, and I think it went pretty well. Thanks everyone for coming. It's nice to have in-person programs again. Um, next week we are going to have Thursday at 6, the Maine State Museum come, and they're going to do Maine in 3D. So they're going to have old stereoscopes from the, er from the early 20th century and the 19th century. Uh, we're going to put them up on the TV, and they've been converted so that you can use... 3D glasses to look at them oh, neat. in 3D. So that should be really cool. So please come back next uh, Thursday at 6 for that. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and there, Keisha has a sign-up sheet in the oh, back if you'd like more information. Yeah, um, if you put your name and your email list, you 
you can sign up for my newsletter and for um, Lori has a garden newsletter. Yes, Central Maine Garden Newsletter. Yeah. You'll send us that automatically if you left our email? Or? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And it's just that one sign up paper that both? We, we can share. share. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 only signed on one. <laughs> and if we can't make it April 28th, is, did you say it's on Facebook? Or? Yes, I'm, I'm streaming it on Facebook oh. right now. Okay. And I freaked out at the beginning. Okay. You might have seen me run out. Okay. I thought the sound wasn't working, but I think it's actually working now. Um, what, what's the link? Um, it's just on our Facebook page. Thompson so if you go to the Thompson right. Free okay. Library, okay. I'm going to make events to them as well. And if you okay. sign up for the event, it will automatically let you know when it starts. To, it'll send you a notification. Um, and we're, we're hoping to take the recording from this and put it on the Food Center's YouTube channel, and then we'll cross-promote it. So yeah. if you follow any of these three organizations okay. on Facebook, hopefully you see it. Mm -hmm. If you join by Facebook last, next time, though, you have to say, I was there in person last time. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> So the seed starting um, medium, yeah, it's it's for starting seeds. It's not, you know, you can't, you know, use it as your potting mix for, for later on. But, yeah, uh, there's also a bookmark in the back. And on the back it says, you know, what seeds we're starting now. So if you mm -hmm. want to take a look at the bookmark, okay. it'll show you what you could be starting. Oh, Is it this one? Yes. Nice. It's in March, late March. <laughs> I think we're kale and... Yeah, what are we? Celery. Celery. Okay. Yeah. Foxglove, yeah. butterfly weed. Oh, mm -hmm. late. Like this month is just <laughs> going by so fast. Hollyhock, Snapdragon, um, Artichoke, and kohl Kohlrabi. Mm -hmm. Now, with the celery, do you take, like at the grocery store, you can get them with the bottom, and you just put that in your starter soil? I've seen it on Pinterest. I don't do it, but I've seen oh, okay. it on Pinterest. <laughs> yes, that is seed starting. And you can start those seeds in the medium that we're going to give to you. At any time you're looking for any resources, like um, a particular plant that you're trying to, you want to grow or anything like that, uh, give us a shout. We'll send you a bulletin. We'll talk with you about it, whatever you, whatever you need. We got some awesome videos nowadays too. Oh, yeah. Don't look at the ones at the first. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that was bad. But they're still out there, unfortunately. The videos got better. The zooms got better, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I am done. I would you like some help handing out the uh, seed? Since I forgot. Good thing for you. Can I check all these books out? Oh, can I check some books out? <laughs> I bet you have a car.